All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the very first lecture of Comp 151 on this chilly morning, chilly June first morning, first winter morning in Sydney, and it actually is a little wintry. Um, so this course is Programming Fundamentals. Well, some more welcomes. About a quarter of the course are new to UNSW, so welcome to you, UNSW on your first term here. And some of you are even uh, new to Sydney. Not so many are new to Australia right now, but there are some of you who've come from far away. So welcome to Sydney if you've come from outside Sydney, and welcome to Australia if you've come from outside Australia. UNSW likes to start events by acknowledging the indigenous elders and owners and custodians of the land that UNSW stands. So let me do that as well as to start our course. All right. So who's going to be... Oh, well, what are we going to do today? Yeah, that's probably a better thing. How, how are we going to fill in the next two hours? Our lectures are, by the way, are two two-hour lectures a week, common format at UNSW. We'll take a break, don't worry, uh, I, I can't talk for two hours straight, so we'll take a break in the middle, somewhere near the one hour mark, and give you a chance to get up and stretch, go to the bathroom, make coffee, whatever. First hour today is just going to be working through who, what, where, how the course works. Um, second hour, we're going to it's all introductions, introducing computers, introducing C, and introducing Linux. Alright, so a course like this, has a big teaching team. So I've cut and pasted hopefully what the names are there. We may add a few people through the through the term, what we often do. But there's some key names. First, I guess I should, there's my name right there at the top. That's me, Andrew Taylor. I'm what UNSW calls the convener of the course. And I'm in charge of the course, if you like. I'll also be doing all the lecturing for the course. But there's far more people involved in this course. On this call is Tom, who Hello. is out. Yeah, that's Tom's voice from somewhere in um, the north, uh, north of the harbour. Um, Tom will be doing most of the behind the scenes work, or a lot of. Well, actually, we're trying to get him to do less of the behind the scenes work, but he's certainly in charge of the behind the scenes work on the course this term, and has worked on the course for the last year or two. Um, Shrey is also doing some key work in the course. Shrey will be working particularly on the course forum. So if you're on the course, well, you'll have to be on the course forum. Shrey may be the person, the tutor that's helping you out. We'll have a few tutors coming in and out of the course forum. But Shrey, as one of his tasks, is, is, is taking charge of the course forum. And new to our team is another Tom, um, who will be doing some of the behind the scenes work, including setting up lectures. All right, you probably won't deal with Tom, Shrey, or Tom much, but you will deal with a couple of these names here. I'm not going to go these names, but we've got a bright, enthusiastic bunch of tutors. So what's the teaching format? Two two-hour lectures, and we have a three-hour tute lab every week. Lectures online, UNSW lectures are going to be, big lectures are going to be basically online for the rest of the year and even going into future years, we think lectures, big lectures are going to be mostly online. But Tute Labs, we have a mix of face-to-face -face and um, online. So you may have a face-to-face -face Tute Lab, you may have an online Tute Lab. And ongoing UNSW for small group classes, and certainly the School of Computing, for tutes, labs, and things like that, if you want face-to-face -face next term, you can have face-to-face -face is, is our plan. All right, so these tutors will help you through learning how to, learning the course contents, learning how to code, basically. So don't expect to learn everything from watching me in a lecture. These people will help you through the finest details. Now, there are 800 students in the course, so our interaction in the, is somewhat limited in lectures. But by all means, join the chat, say hello in the chat. Um, tutors will often pop in and out of the chat as well. And we've got um, a few tutors who, who look after the chat and cover any questions. All right, before we go on to, to more information, who are you? So I said there's 800 students. So this term, we have a lot of students who aren't doing computing, what I call a computing major. They're doing degrees, other majors. There's quite a few electrical engineers, how I tell you, a little electrical engineers out there, and, and related degrees like telecommunications, and mechatronics slash mechanical engineers. There's a lot of them this term as well, so hello to you as well. 
We also have a, a, a decent fraction of students who are starting their first computing course of a computing degree, and we've got a mix of other students who are just taking the course, but they they think computing will be important in what they want to do in future, or perhaps they're just fascinated by computers. So it's an interesting mixed student body this term. Oh, and where do you come from? A, a lot of students from Sydney, of course. Not some from quite close to UNSW. Some from much further afield. Uh, hello to you if you've had to do a two-hour, <laughs> if you have a two-hour commute to UNSW, like I did when I was studying uni. Not to. Um, and a lot have come from overseas. And again, hello to you. All right. Oh, and a few of you are stuck overseas. Yes, let me acknowledge we know in, in the, it's a, a, th a fraction of the class, I think it's about 8%, um, is caught overseas by the current international travel restrictions. Uh, so a couple of things there. One is, if I use a time, sorry, it's going to be Sydney time always. You'll have to translate. And um, we, we'll try and uh, schedule things like exams to, to make some allowance for your time zones. Um, we, we, we can only do that because we know a lot of the students overseas are just a, a few hours west of us, China and, and um, South Asia. So we'll try and account for that. And we, this, is, this is actually a, a, a good course to be doing remotely. We provide everything online. You're missing a little bit face to face, but you can do the course. Student, we've, had, we've, we've successfully had students come through the course. We had to switch to entirely online for a while last year, which forced us to learn how to do it well. Um, and we're worth noting as well, Andrew, uh, if there are students who are in time slots, time slots uh, that are like not okay for them, so you know you, it means you have to get up at four a.m. in the morning to watch the tutor. Um, just let your tutor know because we can make allowances and those sorts of things. If there are issues like that, just get in, con in contact with your tutor. <laughs> we have ways of making sure that you've got a time slot that's appropriate for you and that you get all the support that you need. So like, please reach out if there is an issue like that. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Thank you, Tom. Oh, who are these tutors, by the way? Well, they're actually, I think every last one of them is an undergraduate. They're, oh, actually, well, that's not quite too. Tammy, Tammy is, a, is, I think it's officially a graduate. She graduated from her degree last term and um, loved tutoring so much. She's staying around for an extra term. But almost all of our tutors are undergraduates who did the course a couple of sessions ago, probably, and are now coming back to help other students in the course. And one of the reasons they do it, by the way, is they had a great tutor when they did the course, you know, a year ago, two years ago. So they thought they're trying to do the same. And, and you can do the same as well. This can be your name put, popped up and up here in a year or two's time. And if you're asking how to get there, how to be one of these tutors, I'd say two things. One is great marks. So, you know, get distinctions, HDs. The other is you know, build up communication skills and things like that. A good thing to do is to maybe take on a little bit of high school tutoring or something like that. Find someone who, you know, in year nine who needs maths tutoring or something like that. But oh, the other thing is any job. So if we, if we see someone with great marks and says, oh, I worked in Maccas as well. Yeah, that's, that's also someone we'd look to take on as a tutor. It's also worth noting um, one of the places that we often find tutors is on our forums. Uh, so the forums, you know, if you have a question, obviously you can post on there uh, and there'll be tutors watching. But uh, one of the nice things about them is that there are also students who sometimes choose to contribute on there. Um, and that's a really great way of meeting other people, of improving your knowledge, because helping other people is the best way of learning. Uh, but also, um, you know, we always keep an eye out there. Uh, so. If you're interested in learning a bit more about how to teach, going on the forums is a great way to do that. So often that's the first place I meet tutors. Like so, Tammy's been this amazing tutor, and my first memory of Tammy is her doing you know really well thought out answers to questions on the forums. And they don't have to be super difficult questions. It's it's how well you can communicate, how well you can explain an idea. Ah, all right. Where do we put information for this course? No, we don't put it on Moodle. We, I think we have a Moodle page which says we don't use Moodle. Past terms, this course has used a, an internal system called WebCMS, not this term. So no Moodle. Oh, well, you do mean, need Moodle for one thing up for this course to get to your Tute Lab. Isn't that right, Tom? Um, access fact, there, to are, there are two things. Two uh, things. To get to your online Tute Lab. And also, uh, if you are looking for a recording of the lectures and you are unable to access YouTube, Probably a bit useless because if you've found it, if you found this lecture by now, you've already found it. But we also host 
the lectures on Echo 360, which is the university's lecture ho holding platform. So um, after the lecture is done, these lectures get uploaded there and you can go and look at them there. They'll always be on YouTube, so you can have a look on YouTube, but if you're unable to access it via YouTube, you can go uh, to Echo 360 via Moodle. All right. Okay, so two uses for Moodle there. Get access to your online shoot lab. If you have an online shoot lab, if you have a face-to-face, -face, you just have to go to the tutorial. And um, lecture recordings, if you can't get at them by the YouTube link, which is, there are a few parts of the world where YouTube links are sometimes problematic. If you have problems with that sort of thing, the next website is what you need. It's the course forum. Um, if you've got a question about anything to do with the course contents, um, you go to the course forum. You should have an invitation email to a UNSW email. If you're new this term, hopefully you've discovered you have a UNSW email. It, you access it with your ZID and your ZPass. Your UNSW email is Z1234567, where that's your ZID at, at UNSW.edu. There are some variants of that, including named ones, which you can explore and discover. You can redirect your UNSW email. Please, 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 if you redirect your UNSW email, d make sure you check the forwarding works. There's nothing sadder than we've sent out an email to everyone in the class saying, here's some important information. And we get a bounce back saying, you know, hotchick23 at hotmail.com does not exist. And someone has forwarded their email to hotchick23 instead of hotchick24 or whatever. Um, but anyway, so if you forward your email, make sure you get it because email is important. We send out, we put important stuff in email. Other courses do as well, of course. Right. So, of course, for anything, yeah, anything relating to programming, coding, bugs, submitting assignments, you can go there. Now, if you've got a sort of an administrative issue or maybe something that's private or something like that, um, you can email the course account. Um, oh, I've got that URL. Well, I guess that's okay for the URL, um, which is cs1511 at cse.usw.edu. Do not use the mail to bit. That's part of the URL. It's a bit confusing having that showing. Um, so you can email that. It's better in general not to email any of the course staff directly. Um, the other members of the staff may, may see your email. I get a lot of email and emails. I regularly miss emails in a cascade of emails I get through the day. So if you email me about something important, it, it, I may just not see it or may miss it. Um, if it goes to the class account, a few people see that and someone will check it and follow up on it. Um, if, the, if, if there's a, something really major, you can you can try emailing me personally and contacting me personally, but it has to be huge. That's not the, I forgot to submit the assignment or something like that. Uh, we get a lot of emails saying, you know, can you en can you you know, enrol me in this course, or can you do this, or can you do that? In general, lecturers and courses, we have, we don't have control over enrollments. Uh, not within the course, not within the school. I'm sort of help run the teaching of this school, and I can't change them. Enrollments are all done centrally. So if you if you've got enrollment questions, program questions, you want to, uh, um, you have to go to the nucleus. So if it's anything outside the course that you have to go to the nucleus sorry all right so they're they're big important sources of information all right about this course it's an introductory programming course i, I want to be incredibly clear about this it assumes no prerequisites assumes zero programming things. We will teach you how to code, how to write programs with no assumptions of you done it doing previous programming. Now, some of you have done previous programming. Roughly, we, we know from past terms, it's a maybe 50-50. Some of you have done maybe in with a teacher in high school or maybe as a private thing, done a couple of months of Python programming, written some small Python programming's done some cute things like that. Well, we find students have used all sorts of other languages, JavaScript's another ones people have sometimes played with. And, we, um, and that certainly helps you in this course uh, because you've learned some things about coding. But we do not depend on this at all. 
we also have students come in here who have discovered years ago that they love coding and that it's something that they're reasonably good at and they've, they've got lots of experience again that's an advantage in this course try to listen to us we'll, there are, you've probably learned some th some things that aren't so good so try to listen to us when we we we, we, we help you <laughs> correct any bad behaviors you've discovered and we'll also try to give you some interesting work to do even if you've learned the basics which the rest of the class is focusing on focusing on but let me it's, be, be in it's also worth noting um the a lot of the previous programming that we see people coming in with is things like python or java which are wonderful languages that you'll have oh, lots of opportunities to learn about and use later but um mm. One of the nice things about this course is we go quite, uh, we take a slightly different approach to what you would have seen in high school in terms of talking about different aspects of the computer. So if you're not careful and you think, you know, week four, week five, oh, I've got this, I know what's going on, you might find that um, we start to cover concepts that you haven't heard before. Uh, so that's something to look forward to and something which is exciting because it might be content that you'll find really interesting, but also just something to be careful of. Don't assume that you know the entire course just because you know the first week or two. So that's actually good. I've seen that not only in this course, but I've also seen that in other courses. You see that in maths courses as well. Someone's got a bit more knowledge than the, the maths course caters for us, and they zone out in week one and two and don't really notice that there's new important stuff coming in in week three, and by week five, they're actually behind. Um, so, yeah, just because you know some stuff, make, be very careful to track what we're doing and, 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 and jump in and tackle the, the extension stuff we offer to keep people busy, interested if they've, if they've done a bit of coding before. I sh now, it can be, I, I mentioned all this, because it can be a bit depressing if you're in a tutor or a lab with people who've done a bit of coding before and they seem to be doing it all easier. Um, you will catch up. It, none of this stuff is easy. It all takes time, it all takes work, so you won't catch up in week one or two or three. But I see, I, I, I see students come in and they've done no coding and they're sort of, they're not, they're not, at, the, not at the top of the class at first, get the second year and suddenly yeah they've discovered they love this they're good at this and they're doing better i remember one particular student who i knew from second year um, and she wasn't even she, she was she knew nothing she, when she got to unsw in second year she was getting maybe distinctions mostly in her comp courses she still really hadn't mastered by third year she really knew what was going on she got a prize in third year i think for operating systems by fourth year, companies were trying to hire her, and she finished up going to, I think, Google Research somewhere in on the east coast of the U.S. So, um, yeah, don't be discouraged. All of these things take work, take take time. But if you know nothing, you can learn as much as you want if you're prepared to work over the next term and and in subsequent comp courses. All right. Yeah, I think there's not. Oh, yeah, if you're in the chat, polite, respectful, same applies to the course forum, same applies to everywhere here at UNSW. Um, we're, this is sort of, this is not a, a, well, it is a social environment, but it's, it's got a goal, it's education. And it's sort of a nice step for you. You're going to have to, you, at some stage, you're going to leave UNSW and go to, to professional environments, work environments, which are, which are a bit more constrained, they're a bit more purposeful. So it's, you, yeah, polite, respectful in the chat. Our tutors will try and help you um, recognize if you're not doing these things. Our next lecture, 11 o'clock Thursday. Always streamed online via YouTube Live. Always recordings available. Oh, don't get too much behind. Um, the, the, there is a trap with recorded lectures where students sort of think, I'll, I'll start watching them in week three. This in particular is a course you can't, um, particularly you haven't done much coding before, you can't you can't start in week three, week four, week five. You've got to be working right from the start and continually through the term. So it's okay to watch the rec this lecture recorded, but do it the, you know, the same day, the next day, and do it before your tutor lab. Uh, Andrew, I think that that second one might be wrong. It's Thursday it? two to four, I believe. Is it? I believe so. Just go and double check that against the timetabling. But so we're going to get we can, Tom's. Please, can you double check that while we're going across that out? Yes, Thursday two to four. Well, at least it's not. All right. Um, and there, in my appalling handwriting, you'll see there you don't need good handwriting to code. Um, so Thursday two to four uh, will be the next lecture.
don't worry they're already scheduled on on youtube live as well so if you turn up at 11 o'clock it'll just say starts at two so uh it's not too much of an issue yeah the other tom seems to be on top of all of that so that seems good all right lecture format yeah so i'm going to give you some th i'll even give you some history um but theory what it all means where it's all going but what i really like what i really spend the lecture time on which i think is really important is live coding showing you how to get a program working what happens when it doesn't work how do you work out why it's not working how do you fix it this process of building a piece of working program a piece of software yeah and i'll try and give you context there as well context in how, how it's all fitting together what you'll do in future courses in your degree context of how it features what you might do it as an intern or a, uh, if you're if you're going to if you're going to work in the field context and how it fits in the past or um, maybe the future lecture slides and everything else for the course course website like uh, strictly the recordings are on YouTube but they're linked to the course website which says we don't do video hosting but near enough All right we have I've said three hour shoot labs in this course uh, they start this week the first one I think the first ones are starting right after this lecture so we have some, I think some running 11 to 2 but they're running through the week they run weeks 1 to 5 and seven to ten if you're new to UNSW week six is what we call flexibility week we don't give you any new content in in flexibility week there's no tut labs there's no lectures we might have help sessions revision sessions extra material sessions but there's nothing you have to do it's meant to be a, a time for you to catch up and organize and get everything sorted to go into that busy last week of term all right also if you're new to UNSW another pe uh, new to university um, if you want to have fun social life do things now is the time um, early in in term when it gets to the last three four weeks of term and and of course the exam period it gets incredibly busy all you can really do in that time is sort of eat sleep work there's I mean you should take breaks but it's it's a very busy time so do things on weekends now get ready to to be very busy in the second half of term it that I mean it's always been that way for people in engineering degrees uh, so a bit of life advice there and of course the other advice would be once the exams are over yeah do something different get away do something yeah take some time off recover relax and get ready for the next term tutorial questions so Tutes, what are tutes good for? They're good for interaction. It's a small group, small group, 20-ish students, where you can work through problems with a tutor who's done the course, knows all the stuff, can take the time to carefully explain the things that maybe got rushed over in lectures, forgotten in lectures, uh, and they'll be focusing on what's coming in the next two hours, which is the lab. So they'll be trying to get you ready to do the lab exercises. So the tutes will, will work through lab exercises. There's a set of tutorial questions, which are, we put up on the class website. They generally go up the, at least the day before. If, we're, we, if, if, if nothing's changing, we might have them up a few days before. One key to getting the best out of tutorials, one key to succeeding in this course is look at the tute questions beforehand. All right, so maybe you've got, you, it doesn't have to be extensive, maybe it's, it's, it's 10 minutes on the bus or 15 minutes watching MasterChef the night before. Is MasterChef still on? I've no idea. There's 10 minutes watching terrible re reality TV shows the night before. Something like that. If you look through the questions, think about the questions, work out what you know, and work out, more crucially, what you don't know in the tute. So you're ready to listen if the tutor tries to explain things you don't know, if you're ready to ask the tutor. So I've said our tutors are amazing. They're, they've got great communication skills. They know this material. They have one big fault. They all understand this stuff, and in most cases, it, it, it came reasonably easy to them. So they might go through the stuff a bit fast. They might not notice that you don't understand that. If that's happening, interact, ask, stop. The tutors will love this. They, 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 they want feedback. They want to be told, you know, who needs to know this? 
So if you ask something, they will stop, backtrack if they've gone over something where they shouldn't have, and, and explain it. And everyone in the class will be grateful if you interact with them. Also, please, please, please turn on, if you have an online class, turn on your webcams, and if you, unless you really can't. I mean, we understand that some people really can't turn on their webcams, but if you can do, it's very hard for the tutors if they can't see a face or can't see faces. They need some help here. So help them out here. Help them out by interacting. Help them out by saying things. A lot of students are embarrassed if they, they say the wrong thing in tutes. But if, if, you, if, you, if you've got a misunderstanding, we, we want you to know the tutes there to, to fix any misunderstandings you've got. And if you don't voice them, if someone doesn't voice them, the tutor can't help, can't help you. So, um, so worth noting as well, the um, two things in fact. First of all, it's worth noting that a lot of your tutors did start the course uh, with no programming experience. Yeah, a true. lot of them are entirely, and you know they've been around university for a little while now, and they've taught the course before. But um, it's it's not like everybody here has been programming forever and they'll have, probably have good tips for you on like if you're new you can ask your tutor about what their experience was some of them will have some probably good advice and interesting stories the other thing to say as well though is um that each tute will cover the content very slightly differently uh the tutorial questions are there and they're often a guide that tutors will use to cover the content but equally some tutors uh, will teach things in their own way they'll have different uh, mechanisms for teaching so don't be surprised if the tutorial questions aren't exactly what you're covering in, in class. Your tutors know what they're doing. They'll obviously be um, tailoring the content for the class and what you need. Uh, and also, um, you know, you also have some control over that as well. So if there's a thing that you come into the tutor and you say there's a particular thing that I'm, I'm not getting, you can ask your tutor and your tutor will likely be quite responsive to covering that or going over that in the lab or that sort of thing. Thank you for that, Tom. Yeah. Um, oh, so for, yeah, when I set out questions, I, I actually do too many questions. I always try to have far too many questions. So don't, don't, if a tutor has 15 questions and your tutor covers five of them plus two questions that aren't even in the tutor questions, um, that's, that's the way it's meant to be. So one thing is tutors panic a bit if they don't, if they worry that there's, they won't have something to say. So I say, yeah, look, oh, look, I've got too many questions. You'll be right. So it's a bit reassuring. It's reassuring for the tutor to know however long the tutor goes, they've got plenty to cover. But what my real reason for having extra questions is to leave some questions for you to revision. I mean, if you if you if you're like me and it, you, on Friday night the thing you want to do is write C programs, you can go back to the tutor and write C programs on Friday night. Or if you like a lot of students, when it gets to the student, um, the study period, you want to go back and write C programs to prepare for the exam. Also there. So there's lots of questions there for revision. There uh, are some yeah. good questions in the, in the chat as well, which I might just cover quickly. Um, so everyone knows most online shoots will be recorded, um, but possibly not all, given that it's up to the tutor to turn recording on occasionally, they may either forget or choose not to. Um, but all of the tutorials cover similar content, but sometimes in a very slightly different way. So it can also be quite useful where if there was a topic that you particularly didn't understand, you can go back and watch the recording or you can go to a different tutor's uh, online class and, or, or watch their recording, and that's quite helpful. Um, the other question is about changing between tutes. Um, the rule that we generally follow is if there, for some reason, uh, is you know, you, you, you're sick or something like that, um, you can go to any of the online tutes. We just ask that you email your tutor just to let, uh, email your tutor and email the other tutor just to let them know that you're coming. Um, you can find a list of all of the tutors on the timetable uh, that's on the class website. For in-person tutes, however, um, basically because of COVID rules and because we don't want to have people turning up who we don't know who they are and having to do extra contact tracing and that sort of thing, um, you cannot go uh, to any in-person tutorial that you are not scheduled for. So if my UNSW says that you're scheduled for the Tuesday 1 p.m. Uh, in-person class, you can go to that in-person class, but you cannot Thursday in-person class. Uh, so if you need, to, if you are sick, please do not come to campus. Um, you will never get penalized for like, if you're sick, not coming to campus. Um, you can just attend one of the online classes, but you can't substitute that for another in-person class. And if you're scheduled for an online class, you can't change into an in-person class. Um, uh, just because of those COVID rules. Let me let me be clear about that. Yeah, vaccines are being rolled out, but last I saw, two percent of Australia have been vaccinated. 
Um, and my partner works in aged care, and I know that some people, some of her co-workers, unvaccinated. So we're not in a state, we're in a, still in a very dangerous state with COVID. I know at your age, it's not much of a risk to you, but you, like, we all care about other people who it's, it is much more of a risk to. And the big thing, the huge thing is, if you've got any sort of symptom, you do not come to campus. I mean, the place to go is a COVID test, but do not come to UNSW or have, you have anything resembling a, a COVID symptom. And we certainly, we, we, that's what we want. So we certainly won't penalize you for not turning up to a tutor or a lab or anything like that with, with, with symptoms. On All which right. note also, um, just very briefly, if you ever have any issues where um, you're sick or you are gonna submit something late, your tutors are very nice people. You can get in touch with them um, and they'll be able to do things like give you some advice, give you some help. Um, certainly also like extensions on labs and those sorts of things are reasonably easy to come by if there's a reason why you need one. So please don't don't be afraid and don't say, oh no, I need to get this done. If you're sick or stressed or whatever, just get in touch with your tutors because they can give you some good advice. So you go to some unis, by the way, and they use most of the tutors are PhD students. And of course, PhD students are super smart and understand the field really well. But undergraduates actually work so much better in these classes because they know what your situation is. They were in that situation like 12 months, 18 months, two years ago. So they know, you know what you're doing, what issues you might have in and inside and outside the course. They can, they, can, they can really help you because they've just come through the same situation. Right. How do we learn to code? How do we learn to like right programming sadly it's not sit through you know 20 hours of lectures or something like that it's not even listen to lectures it can help um, we learn by doing and we don't learn by sadly by having to do a lot we don't we can't learn to code just by writing one two five ten we have to write a lot more programs so we're going to help just you start on this journey with a set of lab exercises to to do each week the lab exercises in large part uh, say here is a task, write a C program that does X. Um, now, lab exercises, we've found, well, no, it's not just us that's found, there's, there's a general studies that show um, pair programming, working with someone else is a great way to learn to code. So the lab exercises, the standard lab exercises are set up as pair programming. So, Oh, actually, I've, I haven't actually taught this course for two years. Oh, well, I should say that I didn't. I didn't think I mentioned this in in the lead-in. So this course has existed since 2017, which is, I guess, what is it, four years ago. Um, I created the course and taught it for the first few offerings, but then it was handed over to a name you'll hear a few times, which is a person, a great lecturer called Mark Chi, who's, who's taught it for the last, I think, six offerings. Mark's taking a break and then teaching graphics in term three and coming back to teach the course next year. But um, and in the future, we're going to have a rotation of lecturers moving through this course. But so I haven't course the, taught the course for, for, for two years, so I've forgotten one of two things. And one of the things I've forgotten is how do the pairs get organized for labs, Tom? So um, what we found is that in the online classes, we pretty much pairs are optional. If you want to work with somebody else, uh, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, and you can talk to your tutor about facilitating that. In the in-person classes, pairs are also a little bit difficult or at least were because of um, oh. uh, COVID restrictions. So the rule that we have there is again, um, those you are welcome to work in pairs. You'll need to talk to your tutor about how to do that in a COVID safe manner. Um, labs that are in person require you to wear a mask, so that does help a little bit, but touching the same keyboard is obviously a little bit of a, uh, an issue. So if you want to work in pairs, you'll see a lot of references to that around the course and you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, just have a chat to your tutor, though uh, for the last few sessions we've also been saying if you'd prefer to work alone, um, there are, we'll, we'll have opportunities for you to work in pairs, uh, but just sort of you can get the course work completely on your own. Oh, sorry. So that's not ideal but there is one key point by the way if you work in a pair you both have to submit the work how do you submit the work yeah there are instructions in the lab exercises exactly there's a command called give but that's all in the lab exercises but both people in the pair have to submit it we mark lab exercises automatically we used to get tutors to look at your work and and and, and mark it which is which honestly is a bit better but it, it takes a lot of time and the tutors kept saying, Andrew, look, no, 
I, I want to help students. If I'm marking their work, um, it, it's that's not it takes up all my time and time I could be used helping the students. So I said, right, we'll just switch to marking everything automatically. You'll see how that works, um, and you can spend all your time helping tutors, helping students. Sorry, and if the automatic marking goes wrong, the tutors can fix it. Um, you'll see. You'll see how that works. Lab marks, labs end up being 10% of your final mark. There are challenge exercises, extension exercises, it's hard to come up with the right word, for, which if, you've, if, if you're finding this easy, maybe because you've done quite a bit of Python programming, say, before, or some sort of programming before, you can certainly tackle. They're not necessary. Some are, yeah, some are very hard. There's, a, there's some nice ones. Do we still have decimal spiral in the lab exercises, Tom? We do indeed. Ah, uh, yeah, that's a fun one. I like that one. Um, some of them are hard for anyone. So they've tried. To, it's it's not it's not it's a challenge to set up challenge exercises that are equally challenging. However, however much coding you've done before, but some of them are challenging for anyone. I would say, but they will take up a lot of time. And there's a decision has to be made. Are you are you, are you in doing math one one four one or whatever and struggling and should be spending time on that? Well, maybe uh, you you should make a smart decision there about where you should spend spend your time. Um, but they, I mean, they can also be fun. Oh dear, we've just lost Tom from Teams. Okay. All right, he may come back. All right, assignments. So we have two assignments in this course. They are larger pieces of work, which continues contribute substantial amounts to your final mark, due in weeks six and ten. Um, we can't start them yet. It takes a substantial amount of time before you know enough coding to, to start on the assignment. So when you've covered when we've covered it enough C for you to start on assignment one, we'll release it. It'll be due just before flexibility week, and we'll have another one due, the main one due, right at the end of the course. <sighs> All right. Assignments. What else? A weekly programming test. All right. We're st we've been fiddling with this format a bit. Um, it, we took it. We took them. A, well, we changed how they were were, were last term, but um, we've brought them back to the same format as as two offerings ago. We have weekly programming tests, which are designed. Well, I, they're there for a couple of reasons. What I really like about them is I, I want them to be a reality check on your pro progress. If you're looking at a lot of, if you're getting a lot of help, looking at a lot of resources, you can sometimes get a false perception how you can go. A lot of students look up, you know, random sort of people on YouTube, random sites on YouTube, and get help from them, and which is fine, absolutely fine, of course. But a lot of them really make programming seem too easy. It's sort of their recipe of success. Watch my video, and you'll learn. You'll be a great C programmer. Watch it in ten minutes, which is of course not true. But it's sort of. I think it's part of the key to being a successful YouTuber is make, making seem things seem easier than they really are. Um, so we've discovered that students can 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 get a feeling that they're better than they really. They've learned this stuff easier than than they have. Don't know as much as they naturally have, don't know as much as they think they do. Now, what I'd really like to do is give you a real exam every week for an hour. That's just not feasible for multiple reasons. So next best thing is I'm going to get you to run your own real exam every week. So you set aside an hour. You do self-enforced exam conditions. No help from anyone. Um, and you've got, I think it's three questions every time. You've got programming questions and you try and do those programming questions in that hour. And if you can solve all three questions in an hour, fantastic. You're doing brilliantly. You solve maybe two of the three questions, yeah, that's fine. Even if you have one and a half questions, yeah, you're probably okay. Um, if, you, if you can't even solve one of the questions in the hour, yeah, you have to take a look at what you're doing, how you're working, what more you can do, what extra help you can get. So it's to give you, you know, feedback on how you're doing. Uh, now, after the hour's up, note where you're up to. See how far you got. Did you get one and a half questions done? Two and a half questions. Now you've actually got to lead a whole week to to complete the exercises if you like, 
and you can submit them after the hour. But the, it's crucial that you use this hour to do to, to um, measure your progress. We'll talk about them again um, when we, we when the first program test weekly test comes out. These, by the way, contribute ten percent of your final mark. Yeah. lovely beeping his teams trying to call Tom oh and we have Tom back maybe there we go I should be back <laughs> teams is wonderful all it right is absolutely wonderful uh, exam our exam it seems far away it'll be it's notionally a three-hour exam but we we run it in a longer window if you like so we say we expect this to be finishable if in about three hours but we'll give you a bit longer um, well, well, close to the time, we'll give you a lot of details about the exam format. The crew key part of the exam will be, here's a, here's a problem, write some C to solve it. There may be other style of questions. I like questions where I show you C and you, and you are asked things about it to show you understand it. Yeah, to, we need, we need to, only pass students from the course who have understood the core content and are ready to go on to subsequent courses. So there is a competency hurdle in the exam, which we'll talk about much closer to it. But it's it's pretty it's it, it's basically solving two sorts of questions, which we'll talk about. Not many students sort of pass the course but fail the competency hurdles, but a, but a few. I should say there are other reasons for the weekly programming test, working under time pressure. Now, the, now there's lots of situations where we work without time pressure. We, we can we can relax, we can think, we've got leisure. But it's not all of them. There are there are two situations I can think of um, where we where we work with uh, under time pressure. We have to do coding, work with computers under time pressure. One is in your near future, perhaps, and that's sort of interviews for internships and jobs. Often they have very limited time for their interview and they want to see you code so that you'll be asked to do a task in, in a short period of time. If it's, by the way, if it's big jobs, important jobs, they'll often do something much more serious. They'll have you on site for hours and get you to do lots of things and talk to you about lots of things. But in your first contact with this, you may well be asked to answer questions, whiteboard things under a lot of time pressure. So doing these weekly tests is good practice for that. The other thing that happens, at least to me at least, if you're working with systems and with a lot of people depending on them, sometimes they break or things break them and, and, and you need to fix them in, in the next 10 minutes, in the next half hour, they need to sort out things because a lot of people are depending on what's happening. Um, and, and there are jobs like that as well. So you, there are jobs where, not all the time, but sometimes you have to work under a huge time pressure because things are broken. It's also worth noting that those those weekly tests, one of the nice things about having them done in an hour is that that hour is sort of just to help you gauge where your ability is. Yeah. I'm not sure whether you went into this earlier, Andrew, because I did drop out for a moment. Um, but it's handy because even if, you know, it would take you two or three hours, it's a good hint of like, well, you can get this much code done in an hour. That's very much a, a, um, a gauge that we can use. And if you're not able to get through one question in an hour, that's really the time where it's like you should reach out to your tutor and have a chat to them. Um, if you're able to get through one or two questions in, the hour, in an hour, that sort of gives you a sense of where your marks might be out, might be at. And then three questions in an hour is definitely like, you know, okay, you're, you're tracking strongly with the course. The, by the way, the first weekly test, I think we, we, we'll probably release them. We'll do something like we'll release them on a Wednesday and they'll be due the following Wednesday. So we might release a test on Wednesday of, of, of week three and it'll be due the following Wednesday. I'm not, I'm not sure we're actually going to go with the Wednesday, but they'll, they'll be out for a week. And what, it's, be... it's usually been a Thursday, but um, it will also depend a little bit on the on the scheduling of classes. But yeah, sort of a, a day in week three, and generally in the middle Actually, of that, week yeah, that would three. work well after the Thursday lecture, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, and but there are emails with every release, and and there are email reminders of when things are due, and you should read your email. I think that's one if of the we messages. We try and put out lots and lots of communication to make sure you're following where the course is. So just keep a close eye on that. I'm also just looking at the chat. There's a, there's a few questions about the, the hurdles in the final exam. The main thing I would just say is don't worry about the hurdles right now. We could explain them to you in more detail, but the issue is the hurdles require knowledge about arrays and linked lists, which are two of the major topics in the course. Um, so like the major thing is just like 
get started on the course enjoy yourselves when you get to week nine and week 10 we'll be really really clear about it and if you have any concerns at that point definitely get in, t in touch with us um but don't worry too much about the hurdles right now now they're not really going to affect you until week nine or week 10. On screen assessment breakdown, as Tom says, you probably don't know what an array is, you don't know what a linked list is. We'll explain all of that. Special consideration. Special consideration is where students get disadvantaged by, by events that affect only them generally, uh, most commonly illness. Um, if it's a small thing and it's concerning labs, for example, or maybe a weekly test, and it, you've just had a virus and you miss, you're a day or two late or something, or you've got, you, you, you can talk to your tutor. If it's a bigger thing or it's incur affecting bigger assessment, then you'll have to go through the formal UNSW process of applying for special consideration. So, for example, if you can't do the exam, um, you'll have to apply for special consideration, and that's all done centrally it's no point asking me um, if if you're ill and can't do the exam there's a supplementary exam and that's all done centrally for the same way for all UNSW courses and that's the week before term three is when supplementary exams are for pretty much all courses and if you find yourself in, in this sort of position that'll be one of the few times when emailing cs1511 at cse.unsw.edu.au is probably the right call because if you're not sure about how special consideration should work um, and you, you need some advice on that, that's probably one of the places uh, that you can get some advice. So we might just refer you on to UNSW centrally. All right. Yeah, code of conduct. Um, anything connected to this course, anything connected to UNSW, um, you follows the student code of conduct, but it's basically just respectable, respectful of everyone else. No discrimination, no harassment, bullying, no aggression. Just be polite, civil, uh, yeah, full respect. This, for example, applies if you set up a Facebook group with you know, 20 other students in the course. Uh, these UNSW rules of code of conduct apply to that as well. They certainly apply in the course forum. Anything connected with the course. All right. um, also, be uh, one thing I, I would say here, it, it hopefully, I haven't seen it in 1511 lately, but um, uh, our tutors are, are both smart and attractive, but please don't ask our tutors out. Uh, they have instructions from me that they're not to socialize with students in any way one-on-one. -on -one. Um, they have to maintain a professional relationship with you, and you vice versa will maintain a professional relationship for them. with them. That's to ensure everyone gets a you know, fair education, fair assessment. It, it, that's our goal here. Let us know if you see anything like this where you think someone's behaving inappropriately anywhere in, in connection with UNSW or CSC. Often there's, there's, lo there's lots of forums, so, social venues and things like this which you may not know about. Do not hesitate to let me know or the head of school know if you see anything or if you feel that you're not, not being, you, know, you don't have an appropriate environment to learn. So I'm hoping that you know, your time in this course, your time at UNSW, these are some of the happiest and best years of the life. I'm not saying I'm not gonna, you're not gonna have to work hard. You may have to work incredibly hard in this course. I, I hope you'll learn a, 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 a conversational amount with that, but I'm hoping you'll, you'll enjoy it. You'll feel safe. You'll <laughs> this will be a happy time. If it's not, let us know. All right, another unhappy topic then is plagiarism. Plagiarism is where you hand in work and you say, this is my work um, and it's not. So that apply, that handing in lab exercises, weekly tests, exams, assignments, you, you, you hand it in, you are implicitly saying, I did this, this is my work. If it's not In fact, you're your- You're explicitly saying it because when you submit, you have to say, this is my own work. Even if you didn't, we, we actually put it there in writing, but even we didn't, just you just handing over this work, it, the, every, the, um, the assumption is you wrote this work, you're taking ownership for it. Um, but we, we actually put a formal statement there on the give command, don't we, Tom? But um, um, so when we work, we often do have contributions for others. So if there's anything in work you hand in that's not solely your work, it's only right that the contribution of others should be recognized. You shouldn't be taking credit for it. 
So if you've got a bit of help from your tutor for some part of the exercise, there should be a little comment there. We'll explain what a comment is, saying, oh, my tutor helped with this bit. Our assignments might let you take some stuff from online, in which case there should be a little comment saying, I got this from the online site Stack Overflow. Um, if it's a team program, if it's a, sorry, a pair program, which you're allowed for the lab exercise, then there'll be a comment saying, oh, look, I wrote this with Mary. Um, so if you hand in work, which is not your work, you and try to claim it as yours, it's plagiarism. Eunice W treats this very seriously. Can I just jump in with the sort of flip side of that? Um, so one of the things that we've done in this course for quite a while now is if you ever feel like you, you you might need to plagiarize, you've gotten up to the Friday before the deadline or the, you know, the Thursday before the deadline, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, I, there's no way I'm going to do this, but there's this really easy service that I can pay that will write my assignment for me. Um, you can instead email CS1511. Just let us know. Say, look, I'm in this situation. I feel like I might need to plagiarize. Um, we will work with you to find a different solution. We will give you whatever you need. We can give you extra support. We can make sure that you've got access uh, to help sessions, even extensions, possibly. Um, like, we will make it easy for you so that you don't have to plagiarize. All you need to do is let us know. We've had people reach out to us like that in the past, and those people have gone on to have a really uh, sort of successful time in 1511. Um, the trouble with plagiarism is that if you start not doing your own work, especially for the assignments, you'll get to assignment two and say to yourself, well, I couldn't do assignment one, I'm not going to be able to do assignment two. And that's a habit that continues. But if you can get to assignment one and say, look, I wouldn't have been able to do it, but I contacted the course, got some help, um, and you know now I'm able to do it, that's a really, really good precedent to set. There's also just a very brief note on Stack Overflow. For those of you who haven't programmed before, Stack Overflow is like an online flo uh, forum that you can use that's got uh, sort of lots of people post help and snippets and those sorts of things. My advice to you would be, um, most the most helpful place you can go in the course is the course forum stack overflow has very general advice and is famous for you know oh you shouldn't actually be doing it this way and they'll give you some completely different way of doing the same thing but um if you do choose to use something like stack overflow or any of the other sort of online services just put a comment in saying this is where i got my code from um and if you're not sure whether you should be commenting code or whether you should be using it just ask like you can ask on the forum you can ask your tutor to send an email saying i've got this source i'm not sure if i can use it just ask us, we'll be more than happy to help. So yeah, actually, probably I shouldn't have mentioned Stack Overflow, not because it's there's something bad there. It's actually much more for students in, like I've just come out of teaching Comp 2041, a second, notionally a second year course. And and it's more relevant there to the sort of work you do there. And Comp 1511, course forum is really your main recourse. Um, all right. And yeah, I guess, we recognize in this course that the transition to uni is hard. Uh, you get, so we try to give you a bit of a safety net. There's limits to what we can do with 800 students in the course, but we, we'll, we'll try. Uh, try and keep you in the course at UNSW working. All right, so that's sort of the consequences for plagiarism. Um, at best, you you know you'll lose the marks. We can't give you marks if something if someone else works. We <laughs> at worst, you, well, you might be asked to lose your NSW. So the worst thing I've generally seen is people with scholarships because people who get handed out scholarships don't don't take a very good dim view of misconduct like plagiarism, so they lose their scholarships. All right. So. Sources of help, sources of help from learning. So we've got recorded lectures. We've got the course web page. Not not super pretty. I think brutalist is what the, what an architect would call it. Um, but all the relevant resources link there. The course forum. The course forum is great. Big source of help. Your tutor during lab sessions. Huge source of help. Your tutor during tutes to, for things that need to explain for the whole class big source of help. Later on in term, we'll set, schedule help sessions, particularly as the uh, as the assignments become a focus of work. So we'll have help sessions. That, there'll be email about that. They'll be linked on the class web page. Things not related to programming, C, the course content, you know, serious issues, you can email the course account, or if it's outside the course, 
the nucleus um, oh sorry ignore that I don't think that help desk link works uh, sorry I missed that in my proofreading the slides so I don't think that's well this might be something there but those are your sources of help in this course if, if there's something you need with systems or things like that ask in the course forum and, and we'll, we'll, we'll query our systems people but that doesn't come up much huh. all right so after all of that talking I, I think I need a, a, a short break to stand up and stretch um, I, I recommend I you do also in very briefly with one other thing just a very quick note if I may Andrew um, please one of the other things which you will find around CSE the school of CSE quite a lot is CSE SOC which is the student oh. society um, the reason I bring them up is two particular reasons uh, first of all they're running what we call lab zero lab zero is unofficial that is you don't have to go to it um, but basically it's just help for setting up your computer uh, and it's running I believe today from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, in Tyree in the Tyree, Tyree building on UNSW um, if you want more information so about wait that, the, is the Tyree building the one that's way down near Anzac Parade yes I believe so yeah so if you just can't, if you just step off the bus and cross the road the Tyree buildings I think the one on the right and CSC SOC, I, let me say, is the best student society on campus, at least in terms of how much it helps the students form, you know, learn and, 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 and in, in their degrees. So that, what, that was uh, Lab Zero, where they're helping you get set up to use your own computer to work in Comp 1511 and future courses. All right. Yep. And um, also, it's, it's worth noting they also just talk more generally about the school and that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> The other reason I'm going to mention uh, CSE SOC is because CSE SOC has an, a Discord, unofficial, not related to the course at all. Um, but if you're looking to get more involved in the sort of student side of things and you know, meet other students and that sort of thing, would definitely recommend posting on there. Um, I'm not aware if there's an online session, but if you join the Discord, one of the nice things is if you have questions about uh, related sort of things like that, um, you can ask them on the Discord and you'll probably be able to get help. I know that after the session as well, there'll be a, um, uh, a link that we post, which basically has all the same content that Lab Zero would have. So um, I don't think that there's an online session running this term, but certainly jump on the Discord and have a look at the Lab Zero link we'll post tomorrow, um, and that will be helpful for you. Excellent. Uh, all right. So yeah, help getting your own computer set up it, it's an interesting challenge because people have this there's a different mix of computers out there operating systems and things like that and and weird and different things go wrong uh, and so you can ask in the comp 1511 forum but the CSE discord is a great place but let me remind you uh, polite civil respectful in the CSE discord all right so if you if you wanted to play with something during the break, you can try out this little app called Lightbot, which the previous lecture Mark recommended. I actually haven't played with myself. I don't play with it myself. I don't actually get time to do these things. But you can play with it and tell me what it's like. All right, so we're going to stop for five minutes and come back at five past the hour to, to start again. So I'll, let me just turn off the audio.
Hi everyone, welcome back. Oh no, let me flip off that so we can see the screen there and you can see me. All right, welcome back. Um, in the break, Tom was saying, oh, the w we, we, we're going to have to specify weekly tests a bit more clearly. Yes, we will, but we'll do that when the first weekly test comes out in, in two weeks' time. So we'll talk more about that and make sure you're clear about that. So it's okay if you don't understand that. There's all sorts of stuff about Lightbot in the chat. Oh, sorry. <laughs> all I know is Mark showed it to me and said, Andrew, Lightbot's really cute, and, but I never had time to really look at it. Uh, oh, I, I did mention, yeah, don't ask your tutor out. Um, that's in, inappropriate because of the, you know, there's a relationship there, a professional relationship. Also, I'd highly recommend not asking out in someone in your tute. Um, it's going to be very awkward when they say no, if he or she says no, and you want to sit in a tute for the the rest of the term. And there are worse things than that. It's when um, they say yes, but it all ends badly in six weeks time and you discover, oh no, we're both in software engineering. We're going to be seeing each other for the next three years. Uh, it's not good. Uh, look for love outside Comp 1511, outside computing, other faculties, other universities, people who aren't at university, but not, not in this course, please. A bit of life advice. All right, let's talk um, computer hardware. Um, the bit, the, you know, the physical device we can use as a computer. Here's an early attempt. Well, I think this is a replication of an abacus. Very popular several thousand years ago. Made out of wood. Uh, and there are limitations to the computing you can do with wood. It is possible to build a general purpose computer out of wood, but it's not really something you should try to Andrew, do. Andrew, how did you get a photo of my computer? <laughs> this looks like the specs of... My, my current computer, which would explain why it shut down about half an hour ago. <laughs> or maybe this is your current computer, Tom. So this is much more closer, to, much closer to a modern computer. This is, as far as we know, a huge step in computing. Um, this corroded lump of brass was pulled up, I think, from the Ionian Sea, oh, more than a hundred years ago, I think. And it was relatively recently, I, I, I had a lecturer at Sydney Uni who was one of the people to figure out how it really worked and what it did. This bit of lump of brass, sort of complicated gears and wheels and things like this, um, predicted astronomical, oh, very topically, and eclipses. So you could perhaps could have used this to pr pr predict the super blood moon e eclipse a couple of nights ago. Uh, so it's what we'd call a special purpose computer. You can't you can't do anything anything any task with it. You can't run Lightbot. You can't sum up numbers. You can't you know, run Netflix on it. It's got one job and one job only, which is predict astronomical positions and eclipses. Special purpose computers actually dominated computing for centuries. Sadly, mainly the biggest use was warfare. If I fire this 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 cannon, where will the you know the shell fall? Um, special purpose analog computers were used heavily right up until the Second World War. It's analog. It's it's all based on continuous things. It's not digital, is what I would say. Um, and analog computers, again, were used very heavily right up into the 1950s. Uh, now this this amazing creation by someone from Britain called Charles Babbage was the first almost almost so close general purpose computer he never quite built the general purpose version but it used brass and steam and punched cards and he, 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 he it could have been realized as a real general purpose computer where you could give it an arbitrary task and it could do it I mean small task, limited task, but it was a general purpose computer where able to do any sort of computation was what he had in mind. He built limited versions of that out of brass. Amazing, absolutely amazing. And this, this as a consequence, Ada Lovelace, well, this beautiful painting actually, lays claim to be the first coder then, the first person to write a program a very smart woman. Um, so you say, Andrew, you're not saying much about this. We don't have time to say much about this. 
but this is a good time for the term to get sort of dive into sort of Wikipedia exploration and, 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 and things like this. So you 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 go off later and you can spend time reading about Ada Lovelace, it'll be time well spent, or Charles Babbage. Or the Antikythera mechanism. So you can explore those at your leisure. This one I, I like. This one it looks a bit boring. This is a Hollerith tabulating machine, which is not well. It's a sort. I guess it's a special purpose computer of a sort. This one was used apparently for the U.S. Census. The two interesting things: the company that built this in 1890 eventually became IBM, which was one of the driving engines of, of, of computing. Still a powerful force in, in computing. So it came out of that in the 1890s. But the other, the other fun thing is that I, I really like this, this. So this used cards. This machine used cards. The cards had 80 columns on it, and it's one of the reasons I mock Python programmers. Python programmers, Python style, they're big on 80 characters, keeping everything with 80 characters. I write Python, and the tutors and I, I often go way beyond that. And the tutors say, Andrew, make it 80 characters, and, and I say, why? And the real reason why is because this. This is a historical thing going all the way back to 1890s and this machine. It had 80 character cards and ever since then people have liked things 80 characters wide. So that's a weird historical fact that's got really good. No, not going to help you pass comp 1511. Sorry about that. But it's, it's interesting, isn't it? They made these cards 80 characters wide and still the Python programmers want to keep things 80 characters wide. This is, yeah, this is, this, this is, this is. This, this, this this is a giant of computing. Is he, he's about your age. I think he's even a bit younger. I think he's supposed to be 16 in, in, in this picture. It's a passport photo, supposedly, which I found online. This is Alan Turing. Um, trained as a mathematician. Trained before... Worked as a mathematician before we had computing. There were these amazing mathematicians working through the through the early 1900s, 1910, 1920. Alan Turing did most of his work in the 1930s. And they worked on computation um, before we had computers. You've got to love mathematicians. They, had no, they just had zero practical implications because we didn't have computers. But they still wanted to understand the, the nature of computation. Two other great names you want to explore in that area are Girdle and Church. Alonzo Church, Kurt Girdle. Really, as they explored the limits of computation, Girdle and eventually what, what came to its um, sort of apathis with Turing changed our understanding of the universe. You can talk to philosophers and say this, this was a landmark in, in human knowledge is um, what their work. Questions that couldn't be answered. What questions couldn't be answered? So, uh, let me say it a bit more slowly, I guess. Turing developed in the 1930s, before we had computers, a model of computation he called the Turing machine. And it turns out this, this is a good model of computation. Basically, all the computation we do now fits this model. And we can actually use it to show equivalence. There's a fundamental question is, you know, I can write a program in C, I can write it in Python. Is there any difference? Is there a program I can write in C and not in Python? Are they? Is there a program I can write in Python and not in C? We talk about Turing equivalence because we can show that they're both a, a mapped to this model of a computation. So they're both, in the end, the same theoretically. Practically, there's huge differences. Practically, gigantic difference. Theoretically, same model of computation. So then the question is, if you have, some, have a program in this model of computation, can you decide if this program runs forever or stops? It, it, and the answer is you can't. Turing showed this in such a clever way with contradictions. It's, it's, you can understand it. it. It will take some thinking. It's very theoretical. It's not part of this course. You can understand it. It's not not huge. It's, it, 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 it's a bit brain bending, but it, it certainly doesn't require a lot of knowledge. It's not as hard as understanding Girdle's incompleteness. Um, but So we showed this before we had computers. All right, World War II came along, and the Germans, the Nazis, were using weird special purpose computers to encrypt their communications. So what did 
the Allies do, the British do. They gathered together all sorts of weird and smart people to try and decrypt, to break their codes. Uh, Turing was one of these people. And at Bletchley Park, where they gathered together all these code breakers in Britain, um, he and they broke the codes. Some people say they shortened World War II by two years by, by, by their efforts. It's, yeah, that's one of these things that you can speculate all you like. There's, well, I'll say it's a great movie. There's a, there's a, there's a lovely movie called The Imitation Game. Um, it's incredibly historically inaccurate. I sat in the movie theater with my partner and I kept saying to her, that's not right. That can't have happened until the woman in front of me made me stop. So don't, don't, don't believe it's accurate. But it's, it's, the, the visuals in it are beautiful and has Benedict Cumberbatch, so it's a lovely movie. But why is it called The Imitation Game? The Imitation Game is actually a, 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 refers to something that Turing did after the war, after he finished code breaking. He invented the Turing Test, which is a famous benchmark from machine intelligence, which is based on an earlier game where you could ask two people questions through some sort of channel where you couldn't see them, and you had to decide which, which one was the man and which one was the woman. He flipped that into the Turing test where you could ask a machine and a person questions and you had to decide which one was the machine and, the, and which one was the person, which is a famous benchmark for machine intelligence. Right. Famously, he was prosecuted essentially for being gay in 1952. Um, Britain eventually took the laws off the books, I think in the 1970s. He got an apology in um, 2009 Sadly, he had committed suicide in 1954, so he didn't get to see the apology, didn't get to receive the pardon from the Queen a couple of years ago, won't get to see his portrait on the Bank of England note that's coming out this month, I think. So, there we go. Alan Turing, a giant. You can, you can research him further. And watch the movie. Yeah, that can be your homework. Well, perhaps for the weekend. Watch the imitation game. All right. Alan Turing came to the code-breaking place and they'd built, they'd, they'd, they'd sort of been putting together hardware for decrypting the German codes. There's a guy called Tommy Flowers, much less famous, but he, he was the hardware person, led the hardware team. And Alan Turing, it was suddenly nirvana for him. He'd, he'd come up with this mathematical model of computation. He and other people like Alonzo Church, this American mathematician, had come up with these theoretical model of computations, but nowhere to, nowhere, no, nothing to do with them. To break the codes, they put enormous effort into producing these devices, and suddenly they could run programs. Suddenly, he had a way of running these things he'd just been thinking about, uh, and that that was that, that was what he saw instantly. So I think he had to focus first on on, on, on breaking codes, but eventually, as the, the war ended, and he got to actually use these computers for general purpose work. These, these can, you can research what a vacuum tube is. You don't see them much anymore, but incredibly unreliable things. That so these computers would break down every hour or two. Some, maybe your maybe your computer's got vacuum tubes in it, Tom. Uh, I think it predates that. It's interesting though because um, where you'll sometimes hear the word bug. I don't know if you're going to talk about this in a few minutes, Andrew. Um, you, you'll hear the word bug around computing, and a bug is like you know a problem with your code or something that's wrong with it. These are back in the days when the first computer bug was actually uh, a real live insect that had gotten into one of these computers and was causing a problem with how it worked. So uh, I think if you can Google, you can find it. It's a moth that got into a device. It was post-World War II, but a device looked like this, a moth that flew in somewhere and, and broke it. <laughs> All right. Let's take you quickly through the, the future of computer. A huge step forward for, for being able to implement computers was the development of the transistor. Those of you electrical engineers can tell me far more about transistors than I know, but they're incredibly, they're two things. Transistors are smaller and they're reliable and use electricity. This is a computer board built with individual transistors, I think. I think these are the individual transistors there. So that's, that. That's nice. What's the next step forward is, oh, wait, what if we can pile a, pile, a lot of transistors 
together on a single device, a single chip. And this is a, com a computer done like that. That's an early computer like this. Notably, um, Unix, the, the, whose descendant we'll talk about very shortly, uh, was developed for these computers. And this is the next step forward in this sort of rush the, just in a few decades, we went from not being able to do computation to be able to do amazing things. This is a single general purpose chip, general purpose computer on a chip, and it's the first of the Intel family, which still dominate desktop um, individual computers. I mean, it was huge news in the last year that Apple have, have stopped using, using Intel on their latest ones and are switching to an ARM device. but. The, that's that's the very first, the very first sort of walking where there's a complete CPU. Now we can't we can't cover everything in this course, so you really have to do comp one five two one. Do we talk more about what's inside there? Sorry, we can't talk about what's inside there. But I want to show you this rush to, to modern hardware. Um, have I gone backwards? Oh yeah, sorry, I have gone back. Oh no, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, so I showed you a, a computer board with where transistors were single things and then we had computer boards where maybe there'd be a hundred or a thousand tr transistors on a single chip this is a more recent one this is more recent 20 years old same age as you are that's what they're doing when they're born this is a million transistors shoved together on a piece of silicon and this underlies modern computing these these massive devices these massive cpus and other devices with gigantic numbers of transistors all there so in there are a million transistors and effectively wires connecting them all together so can i learn how to build one of those yes you can we have all the courses you need i well pretty much we can get you close to to to, to fab being able to build one of these it's not the work of one person all right so that's 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 sort of the, just a bit of history for you to take you through this rush to where we are now so what computer resources do we have? And oh, let's let's do one slide. Yeah, let's sum that up. So we now have this ability, this much more processing ability than 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 the past. What can we do with it? The the options are endless. Um, we're getting better and better at simulating the climate and weather. There are fundamental limits there. No one's taking much notice of the scientists who are simulating the climate. We're connecting the world together in, in amazing communication networks. We're simulating these highly complex virtual environments. Yes, we're giving you Netflix and, and trying to show you what movies you want to on Netflix. So there are all these possibilities that are opening up in future. Um, and you can be part of that. If you, and this course can be your, you know, your first step to it. All right, let's, let's, let's take a step back and talk about what we're going to be using in this course. We're going to be using an operating system called Linux in this course. In fact, we use for pretty much all the courses in the computing department at UNSW in CSE Linux. An operating system is a bit of software that sits between you and the hardware. So you'll be using it at CSE. You don't necessarily have to use Linux on your own computer. A lot of computing majors, students who are doing a few computing courses, do install Linux on their own computer, but you can definitely do this course without installing Linux on your own computer. You can use the operating system your own computer comes with to do this course. You don't have to do anything on your own computer for this course. We've got something called VLAB, which you can connect to remotely. As long as you've got internet, decent internet, doesn't have to be, doesn't have to be a thousand um, megabits per second, it can be a, just a reasonable solid internet connection you can use what we call VLAB which just connects you onto CSE and runs all the program on our servers um, now a lot of students particularly if they're going on to multiple computing courses like to set up tools on their own computer so they can work on their own computer without going through the internet to CSE we've got guides for that and you look at that um, all linked to the course website there's two particular tools. We'll talk about them a bit more. We're going to talk, show you a text editor and a compiler. So for this course, you'll need to use both of those. And you can use those by connecting through the internet to VLAB at CSE and doing that. 
It's not the only way, by the way. There's another way is you can use SSH to connect to CSE's login servers and do that. And we've got guides for that. And some students use a program called VS Code because they like that. Uh, you can, they, there's also ways to do that. There are multiple ways to do this. But VLAB is the easiest, the simplest. They're, they're, it's set up for we to give you an easy way to get started. And if you're in a computing major, you'll often go and do, you know, do it in other ways. But it's what a lot of students use in their first weeks in a computing course. Uh, operating system, a layer between your code and the computer hardware. What's Linux? It's a widely used free operating system. It comes from this great family of operating systems going back to the 1970s, which allow multiple users to use it at one time. So you're on your laptop. There's probably only ever really one user on the laptop. Our login servers might have 50, 100, 200 people using them at one time. Um, multi-user, multiple programs running simultaneously. Many in innovations come from these Unix-like operating systems like Linux. Most of you have already used uh, an operating system related to Linux. Uh, your mobile phone, unless you have um, an Apple mobile phone, it probably runs Android. And Android is very Linux-like. It diverged from Linux some years ago. And they're looking at merging them back together again. But underneath there on your phone is Android. You're saying, oh, can I, can I do the course on my phone? Yeah, in theory, you could do all the course stuff on your phone. The software will actually all run on your phone. Um, it's not a great interface, though. Not at all. So it, that's not something people do. You want, you want as a, a laptop, as a, a desktop. As a fun side note, sometimes when things break around the course, We'll, we'll use our phones to fix it rather than using computers. Hopefully that doesn't happen this term, but that just sort of shows you. In theory, we can use phones to do everything we need to do in the course. We just prefer not to because it's a bit of a pain. All right. So we'll teach you a little bit about Linux. Come back in Comp 1521 and I'll teach you some more. Come back in Comp 2041 and I'll, I'll teach you even more. But well, only a few things. Um, this is just sort of name checking these Linux commands, which you'll use in your first lab this week. So there's four programs, commands, programs that are already there on the system for you to use that perform tasks you need. Um, ls mukd to create a directory. What's a directory? You might call it some, directory gets called a folder by a lot of people. It's a place to store files. Um, and you can change which is your current directory and print which is your current directory. So there are four commands which your tutor will talk about in the tut, and then you'll get to try them in the lab um, and experiment. So ls to show you the files in the current directory, mukdir to create a directory. In fact, I might show them to you shortly as well on, on my computer. All right. So here's a bit more about these two key programs. Gedit is a text editor. It's the one we recommend to get you started because it's an easy to learn text editor. Some people keep using it. So we see students who keep using it for a few courses. Students often switch to another text editor. There are many other text editors out there. People have often have very strong personal preferences about this. Uh, which I'm certainly not going to go into. So yeah, start out with gedit, switch to your favorite editor, ask every tutor you meet what their favorite editor is, try them out. Uh, one thing we'll notice about gedit, students love it highlights bits of C in different colors. The other thing we need to do is to, to run C, to actually execute our C program, uh, which is what we really want. We're not mathematicians. We, 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 we want to be able to do things. Um, well, you may be mathematicians, but th in this course, we want to be able to execute things, run things, carry out things. We need to translate what we're going to write into something that can actually be run. So we'll write our programs in C, this precise language, but it can't actually be directly run by a machine. We have to do a translation step. That's what the compiler does. It takes the C we write and translates it into something that the computer can actually run. One term for this, among many, is it's, well, you could call it machine coded. So we need something, a compiler, a C compiler, that does this translation. 
We have a very special compiler for this course called DCC that includes a lot of extra checking and extra information and tries to help out people who are just starting out the program. There are other SIGI compilers out there. You, you, if, you, if you want to use run C, compile C on your own machine, DCC is a little tricky to get working on a, lot of, on, on, on a lot of students' computers, so you might end up using another C compiler called perhaps GCC or C Lang. Um, if you do, by the way, and you're having problems, try shifting your program to CSE and running it with DCC. You're saying, how do I shift my program to CSE? There are links on the class website, and your tutor can talk you through that. Of course, forum can talk you through that, or you can even ask on the CSE SOC. Discord. So I'm expecting most students will just use VLAB to access Gedit and DCC at CSC. I do just want to note, um, pretty much everybody in 1511, we recommend just do your work on VLAB. It means that DCC is already installed, Gedit is already installed. If you decide that you want to do things outside of VLAB, um, it means you're going to have to start dealing with your own text editor, your own compiler. DCC is not something that you can generally download. It's possible to do, but we don't like support that officially. So um, just uh, we strongly, strongly recommend just use uh, VLAB. There are other options available to you, but VLAB is the best place to get started. So, all right. Yeah, this is actually, uh, uh, Mark has written, I've grabbed the lecture slide that Mark wrote and he's written in a language that hopefully you can understand. So programming, yeah, it's like giving your computer instructions. I wouldn't say talking to it. I'd say instructing your computer. But you're saying, well, can't I just give it instructions in English or you know, whatever language, natural language I speak? No. It's ambiguous and hard to, for a computer to understand. And you know this. You, you try doing some Google Translates and see what happens, for example. Um, so we need a precise language that we can write, a shared language. Yeah, Mark has really summarized it nicely here. A shared language to, to be able to give a computer these instructions. We'll be looking at one particular language, C. There are many computer languages. You can, even, by the end of the course, you can even de develop your own language if you like. Right. C is... It's not that a modern language. Actually, C was developed in the 1970s. There are many modern languages, more modern languages, that use C features. It's an excellent starting point for learning how to control a computer from its roots. Why do we teach C? There's a couple of reasons we teach C. If you're doing a computing major, you should know C. Um, there are places where you can only use C working with tiny chips and embedded devices or perhaps at operating system drivers. Um, you, you have to use C, so you need to know it there. It's also a good avenue to learn about the insides of a computer. It's also a good language for pe people who are working at the hardware software interface, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, slash mechatronic engineers, they need to know C. So there are model reasons why C sort of fits together as the language we teach here. There are many other languages, and you'll get exposed to them in, in later courses if you take later courses. For example, Comp 1531, if you're doing a computing degree, you have to take Comp 1531. We'll, we'll do you we'll use Python. Comp 2041, you might take later if you're doing a computing degree. We'll show you Shell. Ah. All right. So here is our first C program. That's how we write C. Um, we're going to go through these bits slowly, and then I'll, I'll try and show you in running this program. Well, not just running, compiling and running this program. So there's the complete C program, which you'll see yeah, gedits turn different bits of it different colors. Oh, this is not gedit, but gedit will do something similar. A bit different bits have been turned different color. It's syntax highlighting is the technical term to, to try and show you the differences. So let's see if we can figure out what the bits here. So that's a C program. Every little character there matters, more or less. First, this bit here, those slash slashes, they indicate the following, what's left 
there, what follows, should be ignored by the compiler. What that says is anything after that to the end of the line is not part of my program. Don't do anything with it. Just ignore it, compiler. You think, well, what's the point of that? Well, there's no point as far as the compiler is concerned, as far as our communication with the compiler. It's our communication with other humans. And you're saying, I don't really communicate with other pe people. There is a very important person you might be completing, c communicating with, and any of your tutors can tell you this, you might be communicating with your future self. So it's a classic thing to have to come back to a piece of program you've written, a piece of code you've written in six months' time or three months' time, and not understand what you did. So the comment there can be information for you to help you understand what you did, why you did it. Probably, you probably will get to work for, with other people. So you can supply information to other people um, this way. Oh, that's, sorry, that lecture slide's got a syntax mistake, um, which we'll fix. There is another way to do multi-line comments. Don't worry about that now, though. The, the slash slash just to, lets you do a single line comment. There is a way to do a multi-line comment in C, which I've stuffed up in my lecture slide. Next part of the program. So if we look further down the program, we come to this line here, and it's got a very different meaning. What does that line mean? Hash include, I call that a hash character, you can call it what you'd like. Um, hash include is a special instruction to the compiler. It says, before you do anything else, grab this other file here. You say, what file? Well, I don't have that file. No, you don't have that file. The compiler keeps it in a special place, and it, 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 it provides features that you need. What it provides is called the standard input-output library, and most C programs use it. Certainly, every C program you use in this course will use this standard input-output library to communicate with the rest of the world. If you wrote a, a C program, say, to sit in the middle of a washing machine, no, it might not use this. It wouldn't communicate to the world that way. It would communicate to the world by flashing little lights that said, you know, washing done or whatever. But if you write C programs in this course, they'll communicate to the outside world by using this little library. Effectively, it making text appear on the screen or reading text from the screen. Yeah, we'll come to that in subsequently. This line. For now, you can just treat it as magic. It's th this, this is the only include file we'll need in the next few weeks. Come and do comp1521, and we'll, we'll show you 20, 30 different include files, perhaps. But in this course, no, no, it's pretty simple. Worth noting that this is um, like provided automatically. It doesn't need to be in your directory. You don't need to install it or anything. When you run DCC, DCC knows what stdio.h is, so it can just deal with that. All right, the last part of this little program I wrote is a function. Yeah, it's a little misleading. If you've done some serious maths, you've got this a mathematical notion of a function. And there's some similarities, and, but there's a key differences as well. But you can think of a function as a piece of code, a piece of instructions, a, a chunk of instructions. The computer runs this code line by line, executing our instructions. So. We're going to explain much more of this in subsequent lectures. Yeah, we can't explain everything in one go, unfortunately. It's quite frustrating. But I, I can give you some hints. A function takes inputs and gives back an output. That's the mathematical notion. Except, except, um, this function takes no inputs, but it, so it puts this weird word void there to say I don't take any inputs. It gives back in, which is short for integers, which means it gives back a whole number. So main is the name of the function. And main is a special function in C. It's the function that's called to get everything started. So a C program's execution starts by starting execution of main. So every complete C program must have a main function. And that's where it starts. Can have other functions. And in subsequent weeks, we'll get you to write other functions. And that's a key part of this course, but not yet. You have to have those braces. They're part of what I'll call, you'll hear me say the word syntax over and over again. They're the exact characters you have to write in the C program. You're saying, can I admit that? 
No. Can I admit that? No. Can you admit anything there? Really? No. Every last character there has to be there. Removing any character will either have the compiler say, that's not valid C, I can't translate that, Andrew, or it's a different program that does a different thing. Well, the, the, with the, the, the couple of exceptions there. The spacing. The spacing is it, it, it's not part of the program. So what else can we understand here? The printf. Printf is a function in C. It's provided effectively by studio.h. And it's a way of getting text to appear on the screen. So printf is a function. It stands for formatted print. Prints a message. That's a little weird, isn't it? That's a little cute thing. Backslash in is a special character sequence to get output to go to a new line. You'll get to play with that in the lab. Don't worry about that. That's That won't cause you any trouble. It Well, it'll confuse you in the first lab, then you'll understand it, and then you'll be right. There are some things that students wrestle with and are really hard to get across, and it takes them weeks and weeks and weeks. There are some things that every student wrestles with, understands, and that's it. Back, it's character escapes, one of those. Oh, return. Return's not a function. It's what I'd call a keyword. It's part of the language. It's an instruction in the language. It says do a specific thing, which says it, I'm in a function. This is the value I want to pass back. This is my return value. This is my output. I'm returning zero. You think, well, what the hell? That what does the hell does that mean? Yeah, we're not going to really cover that in this course. Re zero means your program is finished and everything was okay. Um, the re it's, it's really important when you have programs running other programs. You don't get to do that in this course, sorry. Um, uh, you will do in Comp 1521 and 2041 if you go on to those courses. But for now, pretty much all our programs are going to just finish with return zero. It's a bit sad. Oh, all, right. all right. Now, I can't run. I'm going to show you the. Um, I'm going to try and show you. Oops. Uh, let me get set up. Um, while Andrew's getting set up, it's, it's yeah, worth noting. Yeah, please. Of, of that program that you saw, um, almost all of it is things that we'll cover in more detail later in the course. The only thing that I would really recommend you feeling comfortable with is just that printf line. That's what we're going to be messing with this week during the labs. So printf just means so, show something to the user. So in this case, it would have shown, hello, Andrew. Everything else that you saw there, the brackets, the include, uh, the include line, the return zero, every program you write for the next few weeks is going to have exactly that. So don't worry too much if you're not entirely clear on what's going on, um, because we'll cover those lines in more detail. All that really, really matters there is that printf line, which just means, hi, computer, please show this line of text to uh, the user. All right. Now, I'm connecting to VLAB here, which is not working very well. I haven't shown you how I've done it because I have a, a complex Linux setup, which is not you, you don't have, so there's no point in me showing it. We've got comprehensive instructions on the class website of how to set up connections to VLAB uh, on your particular computer, whether you're running a, you know, a Mac, running OS X, or you've got Windows or whatever. And your tutors will help you with that, will help you on the course forum, but we want you to get connecting to VLAB from your own computer. But you'll type there, it'll ask you to log in. You'll type in Z and your Z ID, which will be Z5123 something, something, something. And then your Z pass, which you hopefully know. Let's see if I know my password and type it in. I don't actually use my password very much at all. I normally use SSH and SSH keys. I'll hit return and I'll hopefully, gets me a message that I say OK to, and another message I say OK to. And it pops up this interface. Now, yeah, the scaling's horrible. I'm not going to continue with this. But down at the bottom here, it lets me run a terminal. If I can see, the scaling's bad for me. And there I'm running a terminal. The prompt you'll get there in your terminal will be different. And there I can run DCC. And I can run um, gedit. All right. So this is horrible. So I'm going to show you both of these things on my screen. Can I but just make a few notes before you, you leave that, Andrew? Please. Um, when you sign in for the first time, uh, you will also see a little pop-up that will say something to the effect of, um, would you like to use the default configuration or make your own? 
just when that pops up, just say use default configuration. There are instructions in the lab about exactly what that will look like, but it is really important that you click that because otherwise your terminal will look a bit different. Second of all, um, again, there are instructions for this in the lab, but one of the things that will strongly recommend that you run is a command called 1511 setup. And what that does is it just sets some default uh, default uh, stuff around your computer. So it sets it up so that you're always going to use the right terminal. You're always going to use the right editor. Um, that is really, really useful for the rest of the course. There's a third command called uh, 1511 colors, which is optional to run, but it just makes your terminal look a bit nicer. It's sometimes a little bit easier to interact with. All right, let's let's go here on the screen now. Actually, let me flip my head around if I can do that. Hopefully I can do that, yeah. That will be better in shortly. All right, I've got a terminal window. It's occupying the whole screen, so it's not doesn't look quite what it's gonna look like for V-Edit. I can run. I can. I can now run commands. There are actually several thousand commands I can run, most of which won't mean much to you. But there's a there's a simple one that just tells me exactly the current date and time. All right. Um, Tom mentioned another command which you run, which is one five one one. We have some special commands for one one five one one, which you run by saying one five one one space the command, and there's one five one one setup. Which I'm not going to run because it might break my local setup. I'm not entirely sure about it. It 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 it's will set configure things exactly nicely for a particularly G edit for a for a comp one five one one student. So you that's the instructions for that in the lab. Um, what I will do is I'll create a directory. I'll call it I'll call it labo one because that's probably what you're asked to do for the lab. And I'll change to that directory. CD, my CD command tells me, but if I forget which directory I mean, I can use PWD to print the directory. I can say ls, and ls is going to say, ah, oh, there's nothing in this directory. It's best if you put everything, everything you're working on in a separate directory, every lab, every weekly test, every assignment in a separate directory, but we'll help you through all of those things. ls, two quick comments. PWD, um, CD, MCDIR, and... Tom. Um, so uh, there's this question about 1511 setup. You don't need to run 1511 setup every time you open something up. It's just a command you run <sighs> once at the start of term and then you forget about. Um, the other thing is it, uh, one of the things your tutor might do when you're going through these same instructions is you can imagine this a lot like if you had a file browser, like you had you know Windows Explorer or your Mac Finder window open. Um, a lot of these commands are just the, the way of writing out in text, the same thing as, you know, MCDIA. Uh, make a directory is the same thing as right clicking and saying you know new directory cd is the same thing as double clicking on one of the icons for the labo one directory and pwd is the same as looking up the top of your window for the like path to the current directory so this is all the same thing as what you would have done when you had um you know a, a, a visual interface in front of you when you had a um a file explorer or, or something like that the reason that we do it with this is because this is sort of what the computer understands. It's a little bit closer to what the student, uh, what the computer is really doing, as opposed to a, a graphical interface, something like a, um, a, 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 a web browser or a file explorer, those sorts of things, which are a little bit further away from what the computer is doing. So these are just commands that do the same thing as what you could do graphically. They're just um, a little bit sort of more computery, and they get us a little bit closer to what the computer really is doing. They're your first steps to being able to do so much more complicated things, so many much more powerful things that you can do just by pointing and clicking. All right, so text editor, I'm going to try and I don't use gedit myself, but I'm trying to run gedit and put in the program that we, we, we just saw because there's a weird little ampersand there after the after the command that says come back to me immediately don't wait for this to finish the lab's got this in don't worry but so i hit return hopefully i'll get gedit and gedit pops up editing lab oc on my life window all right and i can start typing so i can say so we generally start programs saying with who what where so i'll say this program print hello it's written by Andrew Taylor. When it's nice to know when, so this is June 2021. So a comment, not a very good comment, but I was rushed. Um, all right. Now 
some of, a lot of this is going to be exactly the same for every program you write for the next few weeks. So yes, you can. It's a classic thing to do is to think, oh, I've got to write a program to do X. Last week's lab, I wrote a program to do Y, which is sort of the same. I'll copy the code and start with that. Fine thing to do. Um, what are we doing? There's a really good question in chat, actually. Um, on line three, you left the line blank. Why did you skip a line? So, yeah, the compiler doesn't care about white place space at all. I could put the whole program on one gigantic line, and the compiler would be perfectly happy. We put in white space to try and make it easier for a human to read the program. So, it, it we often use white space, blank lines, to 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 indicate visually to a human that there's difference. If you've learned Python, Python's unusual among languages, and Python uses white space for meaning to the compiler. Most languages, white space is just ignored, but programmers put extra space in to make it easy for a human to visually see what's what, what does this. If I'm typing away, I type my program in. It's got a few mistakes in it. Oh, and I don't like DCC doing that. Oh, sorry, Gedit doing that. All right. So let's let's come over here and try and compile my program. Oh, that's a little weird. Ah, all right. Classic mistake, Andrew. You've forgotten to save the program. You see, there's an asterisk up there on the head of the editor to indicate that there's unsaved work. All right. This is something that happens all the time. Your first question should be when your program's not doing what you expect is. Am I running the same code that I can see in my editor window? Have I saved it? Have I saved it in the same directory? We'll, we'll cover that more in later lectures. But I save the file, and hopefully a file will appear. There are ways, by the way, to look at the file without an editor. So one is called more. My favorite one's called cat, which does pretty much the same thing. But I just like the name cat. More is probably the one you want to view of just that, so that looks like I've got the editor. So I can now say, DCC, can you translate this to machine code? And I, I need to tell it a file to put the machine code in. So I'll call it just hello. All right, here we go to having our first machine code ever. Oh. All right, and it didn't work. I've made a couple of mistakes, sort of deliberately. Um, and if you read, DCC tries to give you extra information that uh, someone who's been programming C for a while will figure this out straight away. But this is saying, Andrew, have you forgotten to hash includes do I have? So let me do that. Read that what's there carefully. If you don't understand why you're getting an error, then the course forum is your friend. But read first carefully what's there. And it's saying line 13, yeah, you have to put a semicolon. Yes, you do have to put a semicolon there. All right, and that, that's pretty much co correct. I just saved I it by just typing very control quick S. Quick piece of advice. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things, especially that will come up this week, but it's a really useful piece of advice in general for all of the code that we write. Um, when you get errors, sometimes you get four or five or ten or a hundred errors at the same time. Um, now, when that happens, but you might be quite worried and think, oh my goodness, you know, I've got a hundred errors. Scroll up to the first error and make sure that you fix the first error first, because sometimes what will happen is that the first error will cause a second error, which causes a third error. So you fix the first thing, and that actually fixes all the errors. So really important to fix the first error first, and also important to keep compiling constantly. So instead of like you write out your 10 line code, and then you realize, oh my goodness, I've got 50 errors. If you compile every line that you write, then you're making sure, ah, oh, good, my code will actually, it works up to this point, and you add something in, that still works, and you can keep going. Uh, yeah, that's such good advice. DCC will actually stop after a couple of errors, but some compilers will give you thousands. But often, even the, it's just the first error that makes any sense. The second and third error, because the, the com compiler's just completely lost track of what you were trying to do. So you've made one mistake, and that just sends the compiler down the wrong way entirely about what it thinks you're trying to do. But we ran DCC. It's said nothing. No news, good news. If it says nothing, there's no errors. We do ls, oh, and it's showing me three files. Yeah, the one with a the tilde there is something that gedit does. 
Um, it's a save copy, a backup copy of a file apparently. Let me show you a, a you know, power user trick. You can say ls-l for long and it gives you more information and you can check when the files were last changed and their sizes, which is sort of interesting. I have 1,192,384 1, bytes of machine code in the file. Hello. Let's let's try running it. Type it in. Dot slash hello. It's worth being explicit here. Um, the there's the questions in the chat about what the DCC command is there. What you're saying is DCC, which is the name of the program that turns our C code into a machine code, that is like something I can run. And then you say hello.c, which is the name of your C file, dash O, which sort of says, please output into something else. And then what are you outputting into? You're outputting into the file called hello. So you're turning hello.c, which is human readable, into hello, which is not at all human readable. And then, as we can see what Andrew's doing down here, there's dot slash hello, which means run the program called hello so you wouldn't be able to do dot slash hello dot c because dot slash hello dot c is unfortunately uh not a uh not, not a program that the computer understands but the computer does understand hello because we've turned it into um machine code or like computer code from our hello dot c file so many things, so many things. Don't panic. We'll, we'll walk you through, me, Tom, your tutors, we'll all work through, talk you through so many things. All right, let me, so there's one thing going wrong with this program. I put two print statements in to put two print things because I think that might help us understand one thing that's going wrong. Oh, and it's saying, un, I call it print and not printf. You're saying, well, isn't it obvious? Surely the compiler should just go ahead guessing and DCC actually know because students do this so often knows this but no it has to do it exactly right all right there we go um, have I saved the file no I haven't apparently let's save the file all right we're ready to go let's run that ah, and you can see both messages both pieces of output both things we've printed are run together on the one line and then the little dollar the dollar by the way is the is the terminal the shell is what I call it but terminal is a good word for it too it's a way of saying I'm ready to take another command Andrew you can see it's all all run together so what we want to do is send what's called a new line and that'll be the last thing we have time for today you know and it, as Tom said this is what you get to mess with a lot in the lab in the first lab so I put that weird sequence, the backslash character in the end, that special sequence, one of a few special sequences we can use in that context in C. I'll save the file. I didn't hit the save button. I did that by Control S. You, you, you're going to have to play with all of this sort of stuff and figure it out, but you will. All right, let's come down. Let's run the, let's, oh, we'll run the hello program. Ah, nothing's happened because I haven't read compiled it. So we're always in this two step thing change the program call uh, use the compiler to translate the program to machine code run the program so it's edit compile run edit compile run edit compile run this little cycle so let's try running that oh sorry let's try compiling that i'm just recompile it and run it and the messages are now on separate lines and it looks good slash n for the backslash n for the win all right, so that's our first C program. Uh, this is the sort of stuff you'll me mess with in the labs. Um, unless Tom has some thoughts or questions coming from the chat, all I can say at this point is good luck with your first tut labs. Turn on your webcam, say hello to your tutor, talk to your tutor, help your tutor. Enjoy figuring, you're gonna have lots of small things go wrong in your first lab. Enjoy figuring out how to make it all work. Tom, um, do we have anything else to say? The only last thing that I was going to say was that um, if you're on an online lab, just remember they're at Blackboard Collaborate. So just log into Moodle, find the 1511 page on Moodle, find the Blackboard Collaborate link, click on that, and then there'll be a list of labs. Um, your tutor should have already emailed you to let you know who they are, and you can look for their name. Their name will be next to the lab. But if you're not sure, when you join the first lab, you can just be like, is this the blah, blah, blah lab? And your tutor will be more than happy to help you. Uh, if you're in my shoot, I'm probably going to start it a few minutes after the hour. Like we'll probably start eight at eight past, just to give you guys time to 
walk around, get a glass of water. But other than that, um, yeah, back to you, Andrew. All right, thank you very much, Tom. Thank you for all your help. We'll, we'll try and keep Tom coming into lectures. It's nice to having someone to fix my mistakes and add some extra information. And uh, so, good luck with your first tut lab. Welcome to Comp One Five One. Welcome to UNSW if you're starting this term. Uh, and we'll we'll talk again on Thursday. And the correct lecture time was two o'clock on Thursday. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, 2 o'clock on Thursday. So talk to you again 2 o'clock on Thursday. Thank you very much, everyone.